Good afternoon, teachers and educationists. A very warm welcome to you all. I am Priyanka Mukherjee, and I'm delighted to have you all with us. With a legacy of hundreds of years and a presence in 170 plus countries, it has been the mission statement of Cambridge University Press and Assessment to pursue excellence in education, in learning, in research. And we, are, we explore various, various ways of connecting, collaborating, and bringing people together so that there's a wonderful osmosis of learning, of sharing of ideas. And teachers of tomorrow, I hope some of you have had the chance to look at the website, teachers of tomorrow, is our sincere endeavor to create a platform where teachers can connect, collaborate, and learn from each other, and also to learn from leading educationists. I believe that webinars like these provide us that opportunity to connect, collaborate, learn, but also to focus on the practical implementation of that learning. We are elated to have with us Mr. Sunita Rao, the senior principal DPS Nacharam Sikandrabad. She is a luminary in the field of teaching and learning and recipient of myriad accolades, including the National Award for Teachers 2022 from the Honorable President of India. Her countless achievements are a testimony to her commitment towards the cause of education and innovation. We are privileged and honored to have you with us, ma'am. Let's delve into the intricacies of innovative pedagogies without further ado. Ma'am, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Priyanka. Good evening, dear teacher educators who have joined this webinar today, um, uh, a session where we are going to revisit probably um, quite a few ideas, but at times I'm sure you're going to have reason to get excited about a few new ideas on this topic uh, of discussion today, contemporary pedagogical practices, a paradigm shift in innovative um, practices. Um, we are all here thanks to Teachers for Tomorrow and Cambridge. I, I wish to acknowledge that. Um, I'm sure with the latest um, progressive uh, changes that have been brought about into the education model uh, with the uh, National Education Policy 2020, um, uh, uh, every single curriculum and board um, uh, uh, revisiting and bringing us uh, new dimensions and extensions to the existing curriculum of schools, whichever board we represent, the national curriculum framework that has been uh, redrafted of late, and a host of other, uh, I must say, guidelines that we have in the educational scenario, all of these actually at times looks voluminous and you know might intimidate us. But I feel if we break it into smaller units of understanding and um, start moving from a surface level of understanding to, um, I must say, a deeper learning, and from um, uh, uh, and take it further with a conscious effort towards visible um, uh, thinking and visible practices in the classroom, I'm sure we're going to make all of that that is being advocated to us true in small percentages phase-wise. But I think the beginning is important. At this point, I have a question for you since I wouldn't be unmuting any of you. Uh, please be active on the chat. The question to you is, for you, what is creativity? What is innovation? Can we have the responses on chat, please? Keep responding as I move ahead in my presentation. I actually brought this slide importantly because if you look at today's learners, they are different. They think and process information differently compared to their predecessors. In view of this, it's so important for us to keep in mind the needs of the learners in the class and not have on one side, one size fits all, on the other, that a program plan that worked probably well two years before no longer would be applicable today for the new set of learners in our class. It's therefore so important for us to keep exploring 
uh, keep researching and keep connecting to the needs. And at this point, when we are talking about metacognition, it's, it's so important to reflect as to the classroom practices, does it allow for children to think? Does it allow them to raise questions? Does it allow them to participate in their learning? And in, in view of that, you carry it further to active learning. And I think our classrooms are now at this point of time being observed for how high is the student engagement rather than what is the mastery level of the teacher in the subject. And I think that is uh, the key observation that we would like to do to check um, whether the class um, gives equal opportunities and whether equity and equal, equality uh, symbol, are symbolized in our classrooms. Um, Self-questioning, thinking aloud, allowing children to reflect a lot and um, keeping in mind that we've consciously moved from assessment of and as to assessment for learning. I, I, I think the, the, uh, it, it's so important for us to include in our teaching practices, teaching learning practices, time and the space for active and uh, timely and actionable feedback from the students. Um, it's so important to encourage goal setting from students, align the instruction to the needs uh, of the students and also to the background of the students in terms of the cultural and the knowledge base and definitely adopt diverse approaches to learning, encouraging children to learn in a host of, um, uh, you know, in different ways. Um, the, these are a few samples. As I said, at times it will ring a bell saying, oh, we've, we've adopted this in school. So that's going to give you confidence about revisiting a known idea. At times it might seem new and therefore that's something that we carry back from the session. Now, self-organized learning environment is the, I must say, the shift that's happening in today's world because no longer it is teacher driven. It is the focus, the very fact that the focus has shifted, uh, shifted from learning objectives to that of learning outcomes. It, it, it speaks volumes about how the whole um, uh, classroom, um, uh, I must say, um, uh, involvement has moved from that of the teacher to the uh, student and therefore the student takes, um, I must say, responsibility for learning and the students engage in loads of activities, uh, both as individual activities and group activities, allowing them to learn in a beautiful, conducive environment being created by the teacher consciously and carefully. Look at how math, um, uh, the Pythagoras theorem, if it is taught as a rule book on the board, um, just imagine what kind of how abstract this can be for the students, but take it to uh, a life uh, situation and you're actually applying it in uh, a daily life situation, bringing it home to the children. Uh, you're going out to the cricket ground to check on altitudes and teaching them. You're using the spaces in the classroom to teach the measurement and so on and so forth. An abstract idea or concept can be concretized and constructive learning would happen when you bring in uh, a self-organized learning environment and bring in practical um, uh, involvement and practical ideas into the classroom. Therefore, inquiry-based learning and interdisciplinary projects, just look at the scope that this particular chart is um, uh, giving us. The social science topic is uh, uh, emerging into a multidisciplinary approach where it's you're scaling across uh, all the components of social science from geography to history to political science to economics uh, uh, and trade um, and, and therefore would touch base on culture and a host of other things and technology and advancements. Just imagine just one topic in the textbook and what we can make of that and the kind of you know, extensions that we can bring to the forum of the students. Discovery-based learning, a time-tested method, trust me, this is not, uh, the labs haven't been created today. It's been, it has been existing in all our schools. Um, and even today it has a value where the child takes um, a time to explore, experiment and understand the concept better and makes notes or other um, uh, documents or records the findings. Group discussions, um, I know that due to paucity of time at times we uh, fight shy of creating enough group uh, activities and forums for discussions. But trust me, you spend 40 minutes to teach and don't allow it to transfer to the children in terms of discussion. The learning outcomes, the measurement of learning outcomes would be much, much lower. 
On the other hand, you have think pair share, you allow the children to sit together on a discussion forum, carry this uh, concept that you've introduced probably at the basic level to another level of understanding. I'm sure they're going to lead the discussion and lead the understanding. Flipped classrooms, we've heard of it. I think post COVID we have, uh, uh, we've actually implied and uh, uh, tested quite a few new ideas in our classroom and flipped classroom has been one, whether it's in the physical mode, as you see certain examples here, or on the virtual uh, flipped classroom mode, I would also show you a hybrid mode. Um, uh, it, it, uh, I feel the scope uh, is endless. You could decide on what modality you want to use, but then when you give the students um, uh, uh, an opportunity to take charge of the teaching learning process, I think they drive it beautifully. And the students also are uh, you know, in an environment where they feel um, uh, less, uh, they're, they're actually in a non-threatening environment. They feel good about being with peers and um, they co collaborate and they cooperate better. Peer tutoring is uh, an extension of the flipped classroom model and gamification. I know certain schools who have created um, uh, uh, a lab where games have been used to teach students physics, math, and other subjects. And it's amazing because the first point of reference here is about students being highly trained uh, and skilled on the digital mode. Secondly, games are, um, uh, uh, you know, actually allow the children to explore and work on their own and then they reach conclusions and it allows them to, ex uh, I, I must say, um, probably uh, have an error, but then they move to the right answers because they are working around these ideas through a game form and it is highly student friendly. Multiple intelligences is, I think MI and DI go hand in hand and we've been talking about this for ages, but then when you go deep into a classroom situation, I still wonder if each of us as teacher educators can say that of my class of 30 to 40 students, how many, uh, what is the dominant traits of our children, which smart are they, and what kind of a multiple intelligence uh, or other learning style are we integrating into our lesson? Consciously one learning style for this particular concept, another for the, the, the next lesson or so on and so forth. Ensuring that we reach out to all the students, be it the linguistic high or logical, uh, mathematical high or naturalistic, or spatial or you know interpersonal and intrapersonal i think uh, it's it's all about measuring our classroom and saying are we giving it due importance uh, collaborative learning critical thinking um, collaborative learning uh, uh, obviously with the flipped classroom that we spoke about bringing in cooperation and collaboration into a classroom environment where children work in healthy um, uh, uh, peer groups um, the grouping strategies itself is a topic of discussion and it's amazing to know how you can actually bring in variation in grouping strategies and every week excite the children about how you recreate groups please look into this um, and try different grouping strategies Critical thinking, um, uh, we observed that uh, um, the higher order thinking questions, the teacher is uh, you know, actually, actually adding value to bringing in application-based questions, higher order thinking questions into the classroom. But at times, if you actually assess the classroom, um, the, we, we've seen that we fall short of critical thinking opportunities for children out-of-the-box thinking, beyond their learning concepts, beyond the textbook and the material available to them, how much do they get to work for the, this kind of opportunity where, because we've also uh, emphasizing not just children who uh, need um, additional support, but we're also talking about children who are independent enough in their learning and need some motivation in the classrooms to uh, you know, expand their learning mode. Projects-based learning is again a time-tested method and will always stay uh, on the top of uh, one of the methods adopted in school, um, which is um, high on uh, 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 a best practice, I must say. Blended learning is the order of the day because if you have seen post-COVID, all our schools have a hybrid model today. We either run a completely virtual school or we run a completely physical school, but then there are many teachers and many a time when we are running a blended mode, a hybrid school. And uh, I, I think that that is something which allows children to have some choices. So for example, some of the learners are unable to um, read school on that particular day due to, due to weather conditions or health issues. If we run a hybrid model, the child will still look at home as a place of study. 
And this has immense scope. I, I, I don't think we should fight shy of, you know, always marking attendance at school, but slowly open up forum for children to engage in a hybrid model, whether it be in school or at, uh, from the home front. Technological learning, again, I'll touch base this uh, during the digital learning. So we come back to my slides and uh, carry, uh, carry it further um, to you know, innovative pedagogical uh, 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 ideas. Um, I, I, at, at some point of time, somebody asked me, what are your learning spaces? Initially, it was like you know, a restricted list of learning spaces. It's the classroom, it's the lab, and uh, uh, so on. But then after that, I re we realized that learning spaces are so much beyond the uh, so creating spaces and experiential and active learning spaces where um, uh, children create new learning spaces outside of their classrooms, um, whether it's for math or languages or any other, um, and, and in effect, working on all the core skills of critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and communication. And um, uh, also this, uh, the Bibliophile um, was a special um, a project brought in where children brought to life uh, or alive the characterization and the characters of books. There was a lot of critical review of books and stories. And um, I, I think the engagement in understanding the books from the point of view of the authors, uh, trying to bring in a new beginning or an ending and having parents, uh, a parent-child activity away from their gadgets, look at the open spaces that they are seated in. I think that's wonderful. The digital pedagogy at this point, uh, may I ask you to rate yourself on your digital skills on a rate, rating scale of one to five, please? Because all of us are so high in terms of requiring uh, uh, digital skills to engage the children. So could you please rate yourself? And as I continue to discuss with you. Um, okay. Ratings uh, are pretty high for many of them, four, five. Okay. <laughs> are there. Ma'am, please carry on. I, I think that is a basic norm that, you know, that we've set for ourselves as teacher educators. And post-COVID, it has made it necessary for us to be able to engage on um, the digital mode too. And so excited and happy to see uh, this uh, kind of uh, response from all of you. So digital pedagogy actually adds value. Um, yes, there has to be a balance brought about in terms of integrating technology in a learning classroom. The teacher is the best person to judge and uh, take a call on how much of digital integration has to happen and how often and uh, how uh, it maps to various conceptual um, clarity and understanding further. It's not necessary to bring in uh, digital integration at every point of time, but then carefully planned, it, it would make a lot of difference. I know that I cannot really, uh, to be frank, I'm not a master of all these uh, 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 digital tools because I represent economics, math, statistics, and I wouldn't have tried myself from the end of a science teacher or an English teacher. But then that apart, I collated all this for you because we say there is a host of options which could be mapped to the teaching learning, whether it's Desmos, uh, um, uh, an online graphing calculator and mathematics tool or, you know, bringing in a mind domo because we know mind maps and children actually drawing a tree diagram and a mind map that you can use the digital technology to do that uh, um, uh, right now. So it, it makes all the difference for you to be able to engage, pick up one of the uh, digital tools that applies to the subject or beyond the subject and you could actually um, uh, train the students also to effectively uh, use it for further learning and enhancing learning. At times, it is a perfect tool for recapitulation of a group work also. Carrying it further to the gamification tools, whether it's Classcraft or Breakout Edu, the online survey tools, which makes a lot of difference to uh, you know allowing children to engage on the online mode when you have a hybrid classroom or a virtual classroom or children are having gadgets as part of their teaching learning mode the online mapping tools that we have, the digital storytelling tools and quiz and assessment tools have brought in a lot of variation in engaging children and the presentation tools, no doubt. Now, if you look at creativity, just imagine a chemistry teacher, um, uh, how well the teacher has brought in um, uh, a connection to um, gamification and teaching high level, senior level concepts, making it more apt and uh, um, you know, breaking it down into smaller units for children to understand. The integrated pedagogy of art and mathematics, um, just see the chart that is there. 
I, I this was something exciting for me because we worked on this elaborately over the years, and I wanted to bring the digital curriculum plan to you. And what is this? The digital curriculum plan has A to Z of the planning, whether it's the lesson plan or the session plans, and it allows the teacher to exactly uh, you know, follow its, uh, uh, its direction in terms of because every single um, uh, uh, extension of teaching learning plans has been uh, put here with a link to the video, link to the instructional language. Uh, it has the uh, activity um, um, uh, sh sheet for the students to be, you know, made visible to the students. It, 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 it has the integration part, whether it's digital integration or art integration or any other. It has um, assessment uh, um, uh, planned for the session. It has the home assignment detailed out, the critical thinking that you could raise in the class. It also has the DI and the MI integration. And uh, further to that, this is another exemplar. I'm, I call it an exemplar of art integrated lesson. It looks at a glance as a social science lesson plan, but it is of an art integrated SM exemplar for math. And just see how the connection has been brought to teach types of angles for class six, grade six. Uh, look at the integration that's happened towards heritage of, because any pieces go indigenous. Take the children to connect to the local arts and crafts and uh, the industry at the local level, the heritage sites of the local level that is one's own state. And I think this is a beautiful example of how you could uh, bring in, um, uh, uh, I, I must say, uh, one of the guidelines of NEP into the teaching learning process. Now, all that we spoke in the past few slides, now what, what does it actually um, uh, finally expect of all of us? Have we upskilled our teachers and oneself to match the, uh, the, the change that is happening from, um, uh, I must say a few best practices did exist over the years, but then uh, the model of education is so progressive and so high in expectations have we are we engaging in con con continuous professional development sufficiently well do we have a need based uh, list of um, uh, certifications and trainings that we would like to engage in what is the area of improvement or capacity building that we want and so on and so forth and that's how the upskilling of teachers would make a lot of difference the um, uh, the reference that I made uh, about the shift from learning objectives to learning outcome um, uh, um, based to start, uh, you know, teaching learning practices. Uh, it's so important for us to have a wonderful model uh, or rather um, uh, an uh, efficacy, efficacy self-efficacy kind of model where we are able to assess the um, the learning outcomes on the side of the learners. And therefore, what, I, what are the types of or strategies of assessments for uh, informal and formal uh, 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 and summative and uh, um, uh, I'm, I must say a lot of classroom assessments that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. How well are we engaging children and allowing to and uh, take, uh, taking feedback from students about the conceptual learning that's happening on their side? Um, uh, a list of you know um, certain. Uh, ways that we could assess the learning outcomes. It, it could be through pen and paper, it could be projects or performances or presentations, individual work versus, uh, uh, I must say, group work, whether we're using exit cards or we're using jigsaw puzzle or uh, cubing or a host of other methods that allow us to take feedback about child's learning outcomes. The capstone uh, assignments, which actually make sure students apply uh, the understanding uh, in real world challenges and research a little more. Portfolios have been the order of the day. And are we really serious about allowing children to um, get right from their first level of reading levels to writing levels, capacities to uh, their uh, achievements, everything put into their portfolios, which actually allows us to gauge their, um, uh, I must say, um, attainments and achievements. Um, the subtle movement from format to submittive to formative uh, testing processes, surveys, authentic and synoptic assessments where we integrate knowledge and skills, observation and interaction, um, uh, a lot more happening in the class to pin down uh, the response from students and having focus groups, uh, allowing peer assessment to be part of the whole system. Um, the this is a, an individual growth tracker, 
we we've actually created it uh, uh, aligning it to the 21st century learning environment and not focusing the report card basically the um, i must say um, document of or rather a record of students um, grade levels just to the pen and paper test and the grades or the performance in percentages but moving it ahead to a most of other tasks that the child does and what are their levels if you look at using rubrics for role play or any other using portfolios to assess the children peer assessment uh, is is uh, i must say an enhancement to the teacher assessment mo model that we've had for years the student response uh, systems proficiency levels assessing the child from the um, uh, the uh, learning outcomes that have been as uh, uh, stated by the teacher for the particular concept or list of concepts to say the child is above grade level that is proficiency level at grade level or below grade level and uh, objective mastery percentages quiz scores and a host of others i'm mindful of the time um, because i know i need to give uh, time for q and a um, so i i just make uh, i wanted to put this together for you about the books that we could read further to equip ourselves in terms of moving from a conventional teaching learning practice to a contemporary progressive innovative teaching learning practice we have all these books suggested the journal and article suggested and um uh, i also have the websites and online resources that one could um uh, i feel this is an ocean of knowledge available at the click of a button on google but i've just brought in a few here on these slides and conferences and proceedings that one can go through um to equip oneself further i think on that note i would stop share and allow you uh, priyanka to lead the question us uh, our session i'm sorry i think um, with one odd uh, internet glitch i had to step in and out but otherwise i have so much there um, probably on in another session we could go deeper into classroom practices uh, in in a much more um, i must say um, detailed explanation and discussion thank you so much thank you ma'am i think uh, the time is the only uh... factor that has deterred us from delving deeper having said that ma'am it was a absolute absolutely insightful session and ma'am a lot of congratulatory messages are pouring in and i request the audience to start sharing their questions in the interest of time we'll start with this particular question ma'am yes in classroom with a spectrum of exceeding expectations and improving learners what strategy would you recommend for maximum effectiveness um i have been a teacher myself uh, and i have had the maximum strength in my class too uh, but i uh, found that if you have uh, actually drawn your plans very well it's so important to carry a plan to the class than you know walk into the class and say i'm going to handle the children so if you've done your homework before in terms of what are the what is this set of diverse learners that's why i spoke about mi and bi if you already know your learners you know their reading capacities that means entry level you've done a diagnostic test then the group of learners have been handed uh, over to you at the beginning of the year academic year and so you know their reading levels you know their understanding grasping levels you know the interest areas in terms of learning style um, you can bring in just one form of learning but vary it like say for example in microeconomics i was able to take uh, a concept to the class where i said i i at least provide two type uh, types of learning uh, engagement in the class one set of learners were high on logic i gave them graphical representation and the strips of paper were given for extending the learning uh, the introduction that i had done but another set were more linguistic they were not high on logic but they were linguistic and linguistic and they could express themselves i gave them a case study but end of the day the learning outcome was the same yes we'll have to consciously move all of them to a particular level of attain but then end of the day the process can be differentiated and for that you can carefully plan and in a simple measures let's not be over ambitious we plan what is possible within time and age appropriate wonderful ma'am there's a repeated uh, request for some strategy to ta tackle the lower grades especially the pre primary grades so can you shed some light on that ma'am um one thing about early years program 
uh, we find that we need to collaborate with parents a lot uh, because the learner is not that in independent. It's not as simple as standing, uh, sending instructional lang uh, you know, instructions uh, uh, back home to the child. So in school, um, the teacher uses a lot of, uh, I must say, hands-on uh, and, col and uh, collaborate to work to teach the learners. The teacher uses multi-language approach so minimum English, Hindi, or, or if, since I'm in Hyderabad, Telugu. So there's a multilingual approach used to, to make the learners more comfortable with the instructions given. And there are multiple orientation sessions done for parents, but they're actually seated like learners themselves to tell them what are the learning outcomes and what is the program of the school and how we transact the curriculum to tell the parents this is what we do in school. So the parents are not in conflict of what they do at home, be it the values we instill or the life skills we instill at that very young age and for the, uh, the uh, uh, as, uh, as high as phonetics because all can't master the, uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, language uh, skill of uh, understanding phonetics, but that's how language is taught to the children. So the best way to do is one is in school, how careful you are in handling the young learners. The second is how you train the parents a little, at least bring them, if not on par with the teacher, at least to understand and appreciate what's done in school. Thank you, ma'am. Questions are pouring in, uh, but <laughs> we will take it as much, take as many as we can. There's another question on um, how to engage gifted students, because uh, you know they are the ones who are very critical overall to keep them engaged for a longer duration. What are your suggestions, ma'am? So I, I look at gifted word both for children with uh, special abilities requiring more, uh, 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 a little more additional support from the teacher. I also look at gifted learners who are very independent, above grade level. So when you look at both, and um, if you're talking about the gifted who are above grade level, then I would uh, say that you need to carry additional tasks to the class. Um, if if the, uh, the percentage of gifted is uh, just one third or less than that in the class, then it's obvious you're gonna handle the whole class, therefore, the, mindful of the fact that it's a smaller segment of the class, if you carry an additional task to the class and know and allow them, that's why we spoke about learning spaces. It's not necessary for all the children to be under our tutelage in front of us. You can move this group of gifted learners to another learning space, give them a task to independently handle, challenge them about time-based mm -hmm. task, you know, and then they'll, they'll wonderfully take charge of that. If it is special needs, and knowing that a teacher will have to, uh, 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 you know, actually support uh, children with uh, uh, special abilities in a mainstream, then it's so important to have, you know, follow certain strategies that the child uh, is uh, placed in the right bench in front of the teacher. Um, probably an additional five minutes spent by the teacher when the others are engaged in a task. You go specifically to this group of learners who want your hand holding. Um, and apart from that, obviously, we would also collaborate uh, with the special educator. Right, ma'am. Again, lots of questions coming in. Uh, what is the correct ratio of early years as in teacher-student ratio in the class? Um, well, <laughs> uh, uh, I think 20 to 25. Um, no, no class of the early years has more than 20 to 25. There are different schools, and so I wouldn't like to, you know, um, give a standard that has to be, it's not a prescribed standard, it's more an ideal class size that we are talking about. Uh, but what works well in classroom situation is having uh, a teacher and a co-teacher. Um, that makes all the difference to uh, because, you know, it's it's not that simple. The, the children of that age don't have eye contact with the teacher and probably all of them don't take the instructions at the same time. All of them are not engaged at the same time. So for keeping that uh, in mind, mindful of that, uh, if there is a co-teacher in the class and there are 20 to 25 students in early years program, uh, it works well. Um, quickly, one more question. What is uh, how do we balance traditional teaching methods with innovative ones? If you can just share uh, some light, uh, I, I, I was witness to um, uh, good teaching practices uh, in Singapore in a school, and uh, I found them being so clear saying we have five uh, you know components in EVS, uh, say class four, grade four, as an example. Uh, we do probably two in the conventional method, and we do three 
in a new age approach. That means there was a balance about it. It's not, that's why I said we can't be really ambitious about everything. You're, you're doing the extensions, you know, uh, taking them through a project-based method. You're taking them to a lab or you're do, doing a field survey or any other thing. So you're, you're probably balancing out some portions of the, or some uh, set of uh, syllabus uh, in the conventional manner, whereas extending the rest. That means you are still giving um, very, very important experiences to the learner as to how extended learning happens. And you're probably also giving a little independent learning uh, for certain chapters and, uh, and uh, 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 home assignments, which allow the children to research rather than just, you know, um, uh, read from the textbook and uh, um, write uh, their, complete their assignment. And the last question, because we have to be cognizant of time. In a scenario where capacities of teacher are stretched to the limits in the classroom amidst exam preparation and parental expectation, how critical is upskilling oneself? Um, uh, I, I would really say um, uh, um, there's no um, It's absolutely mandatory. Uh, the uh, student, the Zen learners of today walk into our higher skill set. Uh, they have in click of a button, they have internet and, uh, uh, um, uh, and therefore access to information beyond what we give in the class. I think it's so important as a teacher that we prioritize. If we have a habit of, you know, spending about half an hour each day or at the two hours per week, researching, exploring on the net best practices, reading further, um, uh, uh, instead of borrowing books only, uh, you know, of, of a different nature, borrow books on education uh, from the library and carry it back home. Trust me, it will go a long way. And then there's a formal way of capacity building uh, um, that happens, that is through certifications and uh, courses that are available. Galore, and today's world, a lot of work being uh, made uh, possible for us and there's a host that we have i think carefully planned at least we should scale up we should have a goal for that and if we time and we create time it's like how we create some time for me time please create some time for exploration and extending one's own learning thank you ma'am i think today's session was an eye opener for many of us who are passionately committed towards our learners. And ma'am, the kind of topics you touched upon, like metacognition and multiple intelligences and project-based learning and uh, uh, critical thinking, blended learning, ma'am, each of this lends itself to a session, I, I believe, ma'am, because it's such an in-depth, you know, uh, exploration of strategies that we can use in the classroom. Thank you for introducing us to these concepts. Thank you for shedding your understanding, sharing your insights on these topics. And we are very grateful that, ma'am, you could take out time from your busy schedule and you could do this for us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for sharing your plethora of experience with us all. And we hope to have you at, a, at some point to discuss on this further. Thank you, everyone, the audience, who has been extremely appreciative of you, ma'am. The comment boxes are overflowing with appreciation and enthusiastic comments and, and, and tremendous amount of participation. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, we, we would request you to keep this learning streak in you alive every week and request you to see these webinars, which will be uploaded on our Teachers of Tomorrow portal also. At a, at, at a, in a few weeks' time, all the webinars will be uh, uploaded on the portal. Do check out the portal. And ma'am, thank you once again for doing this. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, It everyone. was a pleasure to connect with teacher educators across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.